Today's show is about tackling the biggest question of all, at least for audiophiles. How do you put together a great sounding system? Yeah, <laughs> I got some ideas. I think I can help. And before I get to that, yeah, there will be an Audiophiliac Viewer System of the Day later on in the show. And also, I know I've never done this before, a special shout out to my favorite music podcast. This podcast is so good. <laughs> no, it's not mine. Uh, but anyway, stick around for that. But how do we do this? How do we put together a great sounding system? Now, great. Let's stop right there. Great for you. For you, for your taste, in your room, within your budget. <laughs> so it's not just a great system. No, it's the great one for you. Now, some people some people might conclude it's mostly a matter of money. You know, even if you have a lot of money, there's no guarantee that you're going to wind up with a great sounding system. You'll wind up with a lot of very expensive stuff, but whether it is actually great or serves you is, mm, I'd say it's a long shot because you're just throwing money at the problem. What you have to do is you have to face the fact that it's a journey and you're going to learn along the way. And I know lots of people who have systems that cost nothing or next to nothing. They found speakers in the street. They found a turntable in the street. They found cables and CD player and stuff or bought them at a thrift shop for $7 or something. Some of those are in audiophiliac viewer systems of the day, by the way. And yeah, so you can put together a decent system for nothing. You can, from hand-me-downs from your uncles or friends or coworkers or something. So. Many people have, have started out that way. So money isn't the solution. No, it's, it's, you have to figure out what it is that you're looking for. And that's the, that's the sweat equity part of this, of this journey, right? You learn by doing. And as you make mistakes, instead of beating yourself up that you bought the wrong one, turned out not to be what you thought it was, that's okay because you will now learn what you don't want. And learning what you don't want is at least as important as learning what you do want. This is a long-term proposition, right? It stretches out for years, decades, sometimes many decades. So expect to get there in a hurry. Mm, don't, don't, don't even think of it that way. Now you're gonna have to put in some time to get there. But of course, reviews can help. They let you know what's going on out there. But they don't generally help you in terms of being helpful in terms of is it the right one for you. So reviews, I wouldn't be counting on them too heavily. <laughs> They're going to get you most of the way there. And of course, the best thing about your relationship with a reviewer, that over time you find certain reviewers that you feel a kinship with, that you feel like you're on the same page. And those reviews, reviewers, should their opinions should carry more weight than all the other reviewers combined. And I don't think that's over, uh, overstating the case, right? You need to find the, it's like finding the right gear. You need to find the right reviewers. And of course, if you're lucky enough to have friends that are audiophiles who are further down the road than you, than you and they can lend you stuff and you can listen at their home, that can be really helpful. And of course, if you, again, if you're really, really lucky in 2022, about to be 2023, that you have nearby dealers that you can learn from and hear stuff in their showrooms and hopefully talk to experienced salespeople or the owners of the store and learn from them. Because the learning part is yeah, the main thing. And like I said, you're going to make mistakes along the way and don't beat yourself up too much about spending money on something that didn't work out. You just sell it, take the loss, and move on. So the next thing you have to figure out is these decisions, these binary decisions that are placed in front of you. Like, for example, tube or solid state. Hmm. Now, I think the, safe, <laughs> the safest choice of tube or solid state is to go solid state because solid state is just easier, <clears throat> less trouble, less hassles and stuff. But tubes, the allure of tubes and the magic of tubes, first of all, they look really cool and they have a sound that many people love. So if you, know, if you want to dabble in tubes, you know, I think the safest thing is to start with a preamplifier, preferably new because tubes have more reliability issues. Just 
letting you know up front than solid state. So it's be a generally a wiser course to start with something new if you can afford that. If not, yeah, buy used. Just buy it from a seller that has some credibility with you that has a track record of being an honest broker. Uh, what else? Um, yeah, so once you get the preamplifier under your belt and you like the preamplifier and you want to advance <laughs> in the tube world, yes, then you could buy an integrated amp or a power amplifier to use. That's, that's, that's also part of the learning curve here. So if you're at all tube curious, yes, take the plunge and see what happens. You gotta, you gotta be in it to win. And then there is the other binary choice, <laughs> on the expression, and that's analog, meaning turntable or tape, and digital, right? Are you an analog person? Do you feel that you would buy vinyl records if you're new to this? Do you have a ready source to get vinyl? At like uh, from, again, friends, relatives, thrift stores, and if you have a bigger budget, Discogs is fantastic. I buy a lot of vinyl on Discogs, or of course, a local record store. So I love vinyl, and if you, if you have any inclinations to dabble in analog audio, do it. It'll be, again, a great education, because going digital, which is certainly simpler and <laughs> cheaper to do in terms of at least the music itself, because you can stream it, uh, yeah, digital is always the fallback position in the analog versus digital. But if you're, if you're analog curious at all, I strongly recommend taking the plunge. When it comes to getting your first turntable, unless you have uh, a known seller, let's say a friend, who has a decent turntable that they want to sell you, I would not buy a used turntable. There's just too many things that can go wrong, but you can buy terrific affordable turntables from companies like Fluence and U-Turn Audio, just to give you two easy examples. I think both companies make terrific, affordable turntables. And then there's tape. Yeah, analog tape, reel-to-reel -reel tape is coming up strong for a certain certain breed of audiophile, usually ones that have deep pockets. I would, now that I would say, that's a deep pocket game if there ever was one, because buying uh, the machine is one thing, but to buy decent quality usually used reel-to-reel -reel tapes is a whole other ball game. So that's, what it says, those are for advanced uh, audiophiles. I wouldn't start with that. No, don't, don't go there. So room treatment, yeah, it has its place, so to speak, absolutely. But I, I'm not here to tell you that it's gonna transform a problem room into a great sounding room. It can make an improvement. It can improve your room acoustics 10% or 20% or something. It's not gonna be a day and night difference. And to do it really, well, to get a bigger difference, you have to cover more and more surface area of their room in terms of the walls and maybe even your ceiling. And that runs into <laughs> real money. So yeah, room treatment. But the thing I do say about your room, whatever room it is right now, you should try uh, putting your speakers in as many different places in the room as possible, different walls within that room. And of course, the cheapest tweak of all, well, free, is to move your speakers out into the room and get them away from the walls and certainly from corners. So that can make a difference. It's all part of this, of this journey of learning how to listen. But here's the part that makes this so complex because rooms are rooms and typical rooms that are, uh, you know, 11 by 14 feet or 16 feet or something like that. There's, that's the most common room size, right? Small, not tiny, tiny, not big. A lot of people are gonna be stuck with rooms of that size of similar construction. But what varies more than the room is you. <laughs> Your taste in music, how loud you listen, and the more different kinds of music you listen to. If you say, I listen to everything. I listen to opera, I listen to country and western, hip hop, jazz. Well, the more you listen to, that's fantastic for you as a human being to listen and enjoy different kinds of music. But then expecting that this given system is gonna do, do justice to those different genres, that's trickier. You know, if some, when I was selling hi-fi, when, when I'd have a customer and say, I really only listen to one thing. I listen to opera like 90% of the time, or I listen to hip hop music 90% of the time. That's easier because you say, okay, I know where we're going. When, when you want 
different genres to all sound really good, that's harder because they have different demands, right? And how loud you listen is also part of it, meaning, oh, I only listen very, very quietly. That's so much easier than people who say, no, occasionally I want to party and really crank the hell out of it. Yeah, that's going to make it, that's going to make it tougher. The other thing you guys have to grapple with is coming to terms with the fact that your favorite music, whether you're streaming it or you're playing vinyl or reel-to-reel -reel tape or cassettes, whatever it is, that the sound quality of your music collection in whatever form it takes, the sound quality of those recordings is going to be highly variable. Some of it is going to sound great, it's just great sounding recordings. The right choices were made in recording, mixing, and mastering those recordings and it came out and it's just wonderful. But that might be 10% of your music collection. The bulk of it is going to be okay and some of it is going to sound like crap. And you have to, or I would urge you strongly, to accept that fact, to not get frustrated that most of it doesn't sound exceptional. Because if you want all of it to sound exceptional and it's just not there in the recordings themselves, well there's not much that you can do about it. I mean if it turns out that most of the music that you love isn't well recorded. I'm gonna, you fill in the genre and the type. I don't want to offend anybody. You don't want to put together a system that's just so transparent and pure that you're just hearing how awful most of that music is, assuming that that's the case, right? No, you want a system. If your chosen genres tend to sound terrible because they're too glaring or distorted or bassy or this or that, you need to put together a system that makes the best, makes the best of it, right? That that's the simplest workaround solution is that you have to, I'm pointing to you, you have to mentally adjust to the fact that it's not going to be great. It's just not. And to expect that only with the, the, some other magic speaker or amplifier or something, that that will make it sound great, that's an unrealistic expectation. It just is. So you just have to come to terms with that. You know, there is one fairly straight ahead solution to the variability question of the sound of your recordings. And that is, is to use an equalizer to <laughs> smooth out some of those problems. So if some of the recordings are too bright and screechy and in your face, yeah, if you buy an equalizer and you turn down certain frequencies, let's say 2K or 3K or 4K, you can really, you know, smooth over those rough edges. And if some of your recordings have way too much bass, they're too boomy and thick, yeah, you turn down 100 hertz and 50 hertz, and yeah, it may be way more palatable. And of course, some recordings have too little bass, and you give them a little nudge up within limits, and you can have some satisfaction of making them a little bit more palatable. We'll put it that way. So that's always an option for people whose music collections tend to be... Mm, not so stellar in their sound quality, right? But even for people that have mostly good collections, but you have some handful of recordings that just don't sound good, but you love the music, yeah, having an equalizer in line to deal with those is a really good idea. Really good idea. And you don't have to spend a lot of money. I think the least expensive shit equalizer, the Loki, is $150. And there you go. Problem solved. Or problem... <laughs> fixed or tweaked a little bit to make it more to your liking. You know, and then there's another solution is, if possible, if budget allows and space allows, is to have more than one pair of speakers. Yeah. If you have a set of speakers that really excels at rock music and dance music and hip hop and use the music for that over that set of speakers, let's say Klipsch's to give an easy example, and then you also love chamber music and other quieter music and acoustic folk music and have another set of speakers for that, let's say Magnapans, and then you, <laughs> you know, select and serve. You, you pick the right speakers for the music genre that you're listening to at that moment. That is, like I say, where possible, a way to approach these, these questions. I sometimes forget that some of you guys have already achieved this, that you, or you have more than one room full of audio, you know, or you have uh, more than one set of speakers or one set of electronics. You already are, you already have tube electronics and solid state electronics and you have analog and you have digital. So you already have solved that problem that way. So as I said, the, the bottom line through all of this 
is that there is no one size that fits all that makes all audiophiles happy, right? We're each looking for our own thing and as we fine tune it over the years, over the decades, and get closer and closer to the sound that we want, that's part of the fun of the hobby. It truly is. I understand a lot of you can't do that. You don't have the budget, you don't have the space, you, you just, it doesn't work for you to have multiple systems and speakers and electronics, that's not possible. That's cool too. Embrace the differences in how your music sounds over the system. That not all of it is gonna sound great, that not all of it is gonna be exactly what you want. But it's all, it does come down to enjoying the music and accepting it, embrace the differences. And that's a beautiful thing just, just by itself, right? Just enjoy what you have. That's, yeah, that's the best summation of all. Enjoy what you have. Is there always something better down the road or around the corner? Yeah, of course. But be here now. Listen to what you have. Enjoy what you have. And uh, yeah, that's a beautiful thing. And speaking of a beautiful thing, yes, it is now time for the Audiophiliac Viewer System of the Day. Hey, this one comes from Chris. It's an all tube vintage system. Alltech 604 duplex speakers. A Macintosh MC240 tube amp. Marantz 7 tube preamp. Fisher R200 tube tuner. The turntable is a Denon DP59L direct drive. Oh, then there's a subwoofer in there, a Rhythmic F12G. Speaker stands are by <laughs> Home Depot, and there's a Bluetooth streamer, not tube. Now there's some upgrades planned, a tube powered sub, custom speaker stands, and of course, <laughs> it's the trend now, a reel-to-reel -reel tape deck. Thanks, Chris, and have a great new year. Okay, we are back. My name is Steve Guttenberg, and I am the Audiophiliac, and I want to tell you about an incredible podcast. And no, it's not my podcast. It's called A History of Rock Music in 500 Songs. It's by, it's, it's, it's produced by a gentleman named Andrew Hickey. And he's planning on doing 50 episodes a year. So it's going to take a while to get through this whole thing. And it's not all of rock history. It ends in uh, 1999. I forget the starting year of this series. But... They're beautiful. They're so well crafted, so well researched, so deep. Sure, if you're into rock music and you love to learn more and more about your favorite bands and songs, you, I, I can't urge you strongly enough to check out a history of rock music in 500 songs. And by the way, there's no commercials. It's completely supported by his patrons through Patreon. So that's a nice way. And you can hear it pretty much wherever you hear podcasts. I listen to it over Spotify, but I'm sure there's many ways to check out this incredible podcast. So, and if you guys, if some of you already know about it, please leave comments. So it's not just me saying that a history of rock music and 500 songs is really something worth checking out. So please feel free to chime in. You know, as re regarding my own podcast, <laughs> the Audiophiliac podcast, I'm back to not being sure how to proceed because not enough of you are actually listening to it. So I, I'm getting the impression that you're not that interested in a podcast from the Audiophiliac. Um, so I'm, again, I'm back in a holding pattern trying to figure out the next step. I'm not giving up on it just yet and I will continue to produce episodes here and there. But for the time being, mm, it's in a holding pattern. Let's put it that way. So if you've yet to check out the, the podcast, um, it's in the, the, the link is in the description below this video. And uh, yeah, if you have yet to subscribe to the channel, please do. If you like an episode, please hit the like button. And uh, well, we've just passed Christmas. We're on our way to New Year's. Thank you guys for being such loyal supporters of the show. Oh, and, and yeah, you know, I, I have my own Patreon. So yeah, if you'd like to support this show, The Audiophiliac, through Patreon, I would be forever grateful. The address for my Patreon is on the screen right now. And with that, I can say it's been a great run. Five years into the Audiophiliac, and uh, I'm, in, I'm enjoying making these episodes more and more. So 
thanks for being there. Thanks for watching. And I hope to see you again, not just next time, but next year in 2023. Thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.